Hello. Uh, good mo morning, ladies and gentlemen. Can everybody hear me? A little bit louder, perhaps? Oh. Okay. So, just keep talking. Okay, okay. Um, before we start anything, can I ask you to please switch off your cell phones or at least put them on silent? Otherwise, there's a thousand rand fine if it goes off during the lecture. Okay. Is that better? Ah, okay, thanks. Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me huge pleasure, both personal and, call it business, to introduce our speaker today, who is not only a personal friend, but happens to be an excellent lecturer. This is her third year at UCT. Uh, the first two lectures were on art of the First World War, and last year, Leonardo da Vinci. Annette, Dr. Annette Chogivska-Schein hails from Washington, D.C., where she teaches at University of Maryland and is associated with the Smithsonian. A PhD was in Baroque art and Renaissance art, which, which is covered in, by the period that she's going to talk about today. And I think that we can probably look forward to an incredible lecture, especially since she's one of the three top attractions in UCT this year and, and was last year as well. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Annette. Good morning. Can you hear me well? Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be back here. It's wonderful to see familiar faces and new faces in the audience. Thanks to Medi, well, actually, thanks to Manro, who I met three years ago, or three and a half years ago, while he and his wife were on a cruise, and he mentioned, as you know, that I should come to teach in the summer school, which I thought was impossible. But thanks to his initiative and Medi, uh, I'm here. Uh, for the third time, and I'm very happy to be back in Cape Town. So um, I'm also very um, appreciative of the fact that Medi agreed on a whole series on Rembrandt, because Rembrandt is a fantastic painter who is very dear to my heart, but I always feel concerned that people will not be interested enough in having a whole series on his work. However, I have to tell you that when I did a similar series on Rembrandt for a group in Baltimore, it was eight lecture class. <laughs> so I could stretch Rembrandt for a very, very long time indeed. He's extremely rich artist, and uh, he really requires close looking and thinking. We can dim the light maybe a little bit more, just because the images, I do not know how, how much we can dim it, but we do not want to make it too dark, obviously. Does this look nice enough? The close-up? <laughs> Better? But we don't want you to be in the dark. But I think this is nice and comfortable, right? Yes. I'm one of these people who likes to look at art very closely, and I know that being able to see the details in a painting like this is of utmost importance. And you might wonder, why am I starting with Rembrandt's face? And this is the face of Rembrandt when he was in his 50s. He looks much older than somebody in his 50s today, but think about this, this is 17th century Holland. He was born in 1606, died in 1669. And this painting is dated 1659. So according to that date, he would be only 53 years old. And he looks probably about 20 years older than that. Right, would you say, in this face? Yeah. Well, people aged much faster, and people didn't live as long as we do. 
But there is something else that I wanted to talk about when I look at this face that opens the whole series. And that is the fact that as you look at this face, you realize how much he's concerned with painting as painting and how much of that painting is visible right there, how much of the brush stroke, how much of the artist's hand is visible there. This man was perfectly capable of creating a beautiful portrait very smoothly painted with all of those details that 17th century people admired and audiences. But what makes Rembrandt so special, among many other things, is the fact that as he matured in particular, he decided that he would always, in a way, tell his audience that what they're looking at is not just a likeness of a person, but what they're looking at is painting. So the brush strokes are visible. The layers of paint are visible. In fact, towards the end of his life, and we're talking about mature years, and maturity with Rembrandt starts from about 1655 until 1669. What we talk about is such thickness of paint sometimes that according to one of the anecdotes told by one of the biographers in the 18th century, Arnold Haubraken, you could pick up a Rembrandt's portrait by his nose, <laughs> meaning there was so much paint on the surface. Why did he apply so much paint on the surface? Not because he couldn't paint otherwise. He was a practitioner of what we call rough style in painting, but not always. So we will talk about all these distinctions, but I wanted to begin with this detail from one of my favorite self-portraits of Rembrandt, which is at the National Gallery of Art in Washington. And if I advance the slide, you will see the whole self-portrait. So in this image, here are the dates that I already mentioned. And uh, 1619, and then 1669 coincides with 2019, 350th anniversary of his death that was just celebrated last year. Well, celebrated, commemorated. So here is the portrait that we just looked at, 1659, National Gallery of Art. And uh, in this reproduction, you have to take my word, there is a signature here with a date which tells us that this was painted exactly then. Rembrandt, as you well know, left us probably the largest number of self-portraits among all of the old masters. I have a whole lecture about the self-portraits, we'll talk about that, but that in itself is highly unusual. And he left us a whole range of all kinds of self-portraits. In some of them, he looks very noble. In some of them, he looks like a beggar. In some of them, he looks almost handsome. In some of them, he caricatures his own features. Rembrandt was exceptional in this. Rembrandt, unlike most portraits of his generation, 17th century Holland, seems to have really valued this whole idea of painting as an exploration of human experience and his own experience. And one of my lectures is called Self-Portrait as a Diary because it looks as if this obsession with self-portraits, over 60 painted self-portraits and many more in drawings and prints, was an aspect of a self-exploration throughout his life and a way of recording that way of how, the, how do I respond to the world and how do I appear to myself and appear to others. So here is that self-portrait. And what you can notice in it, of course, is again that rough style in the face. But then, as you go down in the self-portrait, you look at the hands, they're painted in a very different style. They're barely there. Not because he couldn't do it, but because he chose to do that. I mentioned already this rough style, and in art theory of 17th century, actually in Holland, they talked about chiefly two styles of painting. Smooth style, which is associated with Vermeer, 
who I will talk about on Saturday, and this raw manner, the rough manner. And uh, what's interesting is that painters would choose to be in one or the other of these camps, where the painting is visible versus where the hand is invisible and you seem to be looking at something so beautifully painted like a photograph. But what's interesting about Rembrandt is that he's also a painter who very deliberately moves from one style to the other. And within the same painting, you can have very thickly painted areas and very thinly, almost invisible areas. So these are some of the hallmarks of what people would have said in the 17th century was his eccentricity. And he was an eccentric. And by the way, at this time when he painted this self-portrait, he was already out of favor completely. He was losing patronage. People didn't want to be portrayed in this way. But he was extremely stubborn, it seems, persistent, and he believed in what he was doing. By the time he died in 1669, you probably know, he was bankrupt. Even though he had made so much money in the past and had lived in a wonderful house in Amsterdam. And somehow he managed to go bankrupt. So what you see here is a man who looks to me rather thoughtful, not happy, a little bit worried, a little bit concerned. But he's looking at us and still retains a certain composure, right? in that pose, and a certain quiet sense of self-confidence. We'll come back to this portrait when we talk about his self-portraits. But you see another thing about Rembrandt in this portrait? It is so brown and dull. As he got older, pictures become darker and duller. And he uses mostly ochres and browns and various shades of brown going towards black, a little bit of red here and there. After about 1645, there is hardly any blue or green in Rembrandt's paintings. Every once in a while, a bit of red. Was he running out of pigments? No, it's a conscious decision again. He wanted with the minimum to create the absolute maximum pictorially. He was striving to kind of pull out of these shades of brown the maximum you can do in order to create this lifelike presence, in order to create these beautiful sort of values, the chiaroscuro, the light and shadow that he becomes well known for, but also this idea of minimal color palette to make you aware of the fact that even when you're not using the whole range of colors, your painting can be beautiful and worthy of contemplation. Complicated person, but let's go to the beginnings. Let's go to the beginnings. So he comes from Leiden. He was born in 1606, and Leiden was quite a nice town. It wasn't as cosmopolitan as Amsterdam was becoming at this moment. Amsterdam was the center of trade. And of course, you had all kinds of people living in Amsterdam, including a very large Jewish community that had come from Portugal and Spain and had settled there. I mentioned the Jewish community because Rembrandt will be living close to the Jewish quarter and will have friends among them, including some rabbi. But Leiden was actually not just a backwater in Holland, quite the contrary. It was a university center. And even though Rembrandt's father was a miller, and of course Rembrandt always played upon the whole notion that he did not come from very educated background or a high social background, his father was relatively prosperous and could afford to send his son to good schools. And in fact, Rembrandt may have had training that included even Latin. So while he was a kid, and then he was apprenticed to a very, very good painter in Leiden, Peter Lastman, perhaps the best history painter in town. But it's interesting that somebody who came from Leiden, which was a university city, never wanted to highlight learnedness, erudition. In fact, both the biographers of Rembrandt and he himself 
tried to push this idea that he is the ordinary Dutchman who never wanted to go to Italy and learn the way somebody like Albrecht Dürer had done, the German master a century before, who traveled to Italy and wanted to bring all of Italy back to Germany and changed German Renaissance as a result of that trip. So this is just a little map of Leiden from that time period. I'm showing it to you in order to emphasize the fact that towns in Holland grew rapidly during this time period because Holland had finally gained independence. It became the first republic, in a sense, in early modern Europe, and it had defended itself from the Spanish Habsburgs, became the Dutch Protestant Republic after the Treaty of 1609, which was a 12-year truce, but it ended up being a peace treaty that kind of turned Holland into an independent entity. It was one of the more democratic places in Europe. It was a very strong, small republic where you had very fast growth of cities and high urban density. And high urban density, just like in Italian city-states, means that there is a lot of communication between people and there is much greater openness to new ideas. And this is just a little uh, image also from that time period. And this is a museum actually in Leiden that shows various historic artifacts associated with the Leiden University from that time period. So it was a center of learning uh, many, many subjects. They were interested in cartography. Dutch people were very, uh, some of the best atlas makers, as you know, and globe makers in 17th century because of all of the trade and explorations. They were also interested in medicine, for example. Dutch medicine was one of the more advanced ones on the continent. And in fact, in that context, I want to show you one more image about Leiden, which is an anatomy theater. I do not know if you're familiar with these kinds of images, but unlike many other parts of Europe where anatomy would be performed in a secretive manner, as you know, a century before Leonardo did all those secret dissections, in Holland at the time, and this is from Leiden, what they would do is they would have performances of anatomy that are open to the public, believe it or not, including women, including women. You see some nice ladies here on the edge who are coming to observe the anatomy performance? Why? Because Dutch were very scientifically minded, empirically minded in all respects. Whether it was about the study of the universe and making globes and maps, or about the study of the human body, the machine, that is within us. They wanted to figure out what makes us move. So they would have public performances of anatomy, a fascinating practice, because they thought that it was, it was extremely important to learn how we operate. Do you see all these skeletons going around? That's kind of allegorical, the skeleton on horseback, another skeleton of a horse. Some of these figures are purely allegorical fantasy, but some of them may be accurate. They would also have exhibitions of skeletons. I mean, I could be giving another lecture about this fabulous Dr. Rausch in Amsterdam who had a whole museum of anatomical specimen and skeletons and all kinds of things in 17th century Holland, one of the first anatomy museums in Europe. So I mentioned this vis a vis Rembrandt because he grew up in a center of learning. But Leiden, the city that was a center of learning, also as a result of that, developed a very strong art culture. And you might say, why are we looking at all these books at the table? It's a wonderful Leiden painting by Jan Davids de Heim, Still Life of Books from 1628, which is a period that we associate in Dutch art with something called tonal painting. Tonal painting meaning, again, ochres, browns, subdued colors. Everything is done in those rather warm tones with very gradual sort of transitions from one to the other. But 
It is also an example of what we call a vanitas painting. Vanitas from the Latin term vanitas, and it relates to vanity of vanity, all is vanity from the Bible, right? So all this learning in Leiden resulted in an awareness that somehow, no matter how much you know, no matter what you do, no matter how much you acquire in a material or spiritual sense, it seems to be all in vain. At the end of the day, all you can do is sort of have faith in God and separate yourself from everything that is of this world, including, by the way, learning. In 16th century, books were very expensive and very valuable. By the 17th century, printing presses were working throughout Europe, but books were still precious. Inventories of people's possessions would include listing of all the books they had, and they would be sold at good price. But when you see a painting like this in 1628, in, in the Leiden of Rembrandt's youth, you realize that already at this point there is this sense of futility associated with learning. What are books but a pile of worthless paper that crumbles over time? So there is this tremendous sense already in the first quarter of the 17th century that despite anatomy, despite cartography, despite everything we know about the world, we really are not going anywhere. I love this period precisely because it's one of the first times in European history where instead of that optimism associated with the Renaissance, we will conquer the world, people become more introspective and wonder, and then what? What next? And the Dutch seem to be at the forefront of this, this kind of thinking, probably because they saw so much as they traveled everywhere. So Rembrandt grows up in this environment. Now I'm gonna show you some very strange little pictures. These pictures are, until recently, they were not firmly attributed to Rembrandt. They're very small, but they, this is just a view from a recent exhibition. You see they're tiny little oil on panel pictures that seem to show the senses, the human senses, sense of touch, sense of smell, sense of sight. That was also a popular subject at the time. I'm showing them to you because they seem to be the earliest paintings associated with Rembrandt. And of course you can't see them on this screen, but I'll show you the close-up. And as you can see, imagine this is a panel that I don't have the exact dimensions, but I can tell you it's that small. It's not very nice. This is circa 1624, so we're talking 18 years old. These pictures are in a private collection in New York called the Leiden Collection. There is a very wealthy man who has been collecting Dutch art over the last 20 years in New York City, and primarily from the Leiden School. And he owns these very early Rembrandts. When I saw them on display, I said, they're way too ugly, this cannot be Rembrandt. But yes, they are, all scholars agree they are. So he's learning, he's a student, he's a kid still. He's not an early bloomer, he's 18 though. And he starts, like many other people, as I said, with this interest in, on the one hand, realistic depiction, on the other hand, something that's metaphorical, allegorical, symbolic. And in this case, this is the sense of smell. And you can see that somebody added a surround in the, in the 1700s. They increased the panel in order to make it a little more impressive. So somebody thought it was an interesting picture and added to it. But the original is only within that white frame. And it's interesting that he begins with allegory of senses because we talked about empiricism and birth of science. And in Leiden and in other parts of Holland, they're very interested in how do we know the world? And we know the world through our sensory experience. And they talked about which sense is the superior to other senses. And they used 
a scheme that goes back to ancient Greece and Aristotle, according to which the sense of sight is superior to all other senses. But they love this whole idea of how do we represent the senses and the way we learn. So this is supposed to be allegory of the sense of smell. They're bringing some kind of, I guess, su some kind of uh, substance in order to awaken him or put him to sleep, I'm not quite sure. And this is a close-up, and I'm showing you the close-up because I happen to have these details from the light and pictures. However, I'm also showing it to you because as you can look at that face of this man who is approaching the sleeping youth, you see that it's not a very handsome face. That's another thing that Rembrandt becomes well known for. He does not beautify his sitters. He actually likes to show people in all of their physiognomic variety. And oftentimes he will emphasize features that are not the most attractive ones. Here is another example. This is sense of hearing. And once more, it has been augmented. Somebody in 18th century added to this panel somehow. That's the thinking at the moment. But look at those faces. They're not exactly the people you would like to spend an evening with singing, <laughs> right? And what's very interesting here is there is this older man with the glasses. Of course, spectacles in 17th century signify the imperfection of our sight. Our sight is the sense we trust the most, but it is the one which is also imperfect, like all senses. We are limited in what we can acquire through our senses. And then you have this other person with the turban who could be a woman, doesn't look very feminine, but it's most likely a woman, so it's a duet. Rembrandt creates almost a parody, because when people created musical duets at this time, they would put a young man and a young woman singing together. No, he gives you an older man and an older woman, fine. And then there is a youth behind them. And I look at that youth, and I see that black cap. And I look at that little round face, and I'm thinking, is this Rembrandt? This guy is just everywhere. So he does, in the very first pictures that he ever painted in the senses, he puts himself, possibly, possibly, I cannot prove this, possibly he puts himself in the sense of hearing, in the music making. Why? Because music is also a sister art of painting. That's what they thought at that time. Let me show you one other of those early works which are really unsatisfying, just to give you a sense of where Rembrandt comes from. This is also in Leiden, in their own museum, because he lives in Leiden until he moves to Amsterdam in 1632. So, this is while he is still there as an independent artist, but right out of the studio of that history painter Peter Lastman. Not a very nice picture. We don't even know what the subject is. We just call it a history painting. He's trying to tell some story about some king and a knight in front of him. And you can see all these bright colors, primary colors, reds, blues, greens, but I wanted to show it to you to give you an idea of how, he, how his trajectory goes in the formative years. And also to give you an idea of his ambition as a young man because history painting is considered the most serious genre. So if you want to be taken seriously and become member of the arts league in your town, the, the Guild of St. Luke, you have to paint history pictures. Every town that had artists organized in a guild would have a guild of Saint Luke. Saint Luke being the patron saint of painters. So in order to be admitted and get documents so you can work as a practicing artist, you usually would go to the guild of Saint Luke and submit an ambitious history picture. Why history? Because history involves many figures and they can judge how well you paint anatomy, how well you paint action, process, all of that. Just quickly, this is Peter Lastman, the man he studied with. Decent enough painting, Susanna and the Elders from 1614, full of drama, full of strong gestures, 
with relatively strong colors. The idea of emotion and drama is something that Rembrandt picks up from last month. But these are not the kinds of paintings that you go to look at in museums these days. Last one is nearly forgotten, I must say. Not just on the account of the fact that Rembrandt was his famous pupil, but because we are not interested in this sort of history painting anymore. This is Juno discovering Jupiter with Io. I don't know if you know that mythological story, but it's a very funny one where uh, uh, Jupiter, of course, was having a love affair with one beautiful nymph, Io. And uh, when Juno discovered that, Jupiter quickly turned poor Io into a white cow. <laughs> and then this is the moment that is Cupid, and there is Juno arriving with her peacocks. And you know, here is Jupiter embarrassed, and the white cow next to him is Io. Then something will happen to that cow eventually. She will end up in Egypt and become Isis. It's a very funny story from classical mythology, but. The point is that his teacher, Peter Lastman, was interested in history painting. And he was famous for history painting in Leiden, the best one. And this is the guy that Rembrandt studied with. What did Rembrandt learn from him? He learned from him about action and emotion and drama. Those are the things he picked up. But when Rembrandt begins his independent works, these are his early works. So he separates himself artistically from Lastman fairly quickly. And he goes towards the tonal painting of the kind I showed you earlier with the pile of books, Jan David's De Heim, that whole idea of Leiden school, very subdued, suppressed. But he emphasizes light and shadow from the get-go very much, this idea of chiaroscuro. Almost everything he does visually, he models things through these contrasts of very well lit areas and very dark areas. And you might wonder, where did this come from, this fad or this fashion for chiaroscuro, for light and darkness? We'll get to that, but I can mention one thing which is very important, and that is Caravaggio. And you might say, how come Caravaggio in Holland? when this guy never traveled to Italy. He actually was proud to say, I have never been to Italy and I don't need Italy. But he knew a lot about Italian art. How would he know Caravaggio? Caravaggio died in 1610, but after his death in Rome, Caravaggio had a fantastic popularity throughout Europe. And there was a whole group of Dutch artists who traveled to Italy learned from Caravaggio and brought the Caravaggio style to Holland. They are known as the Utrecht Caravaggisti. And in the 1620s, everybody all of a sudden becomes interested in Caravaggio style. And Rembrandt, in pictures such as this early one, the parable of the rich man, is very much emulating that notion of light and shadow and close-up view of a figure, right? with that candle that kind of dramatizes the contrast, that is associated with Caravaggio's style. Once more, we are not talking about a very handsome person, but here is a comparison, just to show you, with one of the Utrecht Caravaggisti. This particular man, Hendrik Ter Bruchen, is one of those people who traveled to Rome. It's a pretty neat painting, right? The concert. And you see, they, they kind of pick up from Caravaggio the close-up view, half-length figures, usually in the darkness, dramatically illuminated by artificial source of light like a candle. And that's the kind of thing that young Rembrandt picks up from Terbruchan. So this is how Caravaggio's style, for instance, enters Dutch art. And of course, what you see, if I go back to this picture once more, is that he also, in the 20s, develops an interest in that subject of vanitas, that whole idea of why do we do everything? Why do we acquire? What's the purpose of it all? This is what the parable is all about. The man with the eyeglasses, the imperfection of our sight, looking at the money, looking at all these objects associated with 
ownership, property of sorts, and then all those worthless piles of papers, just like in that Vanitas painting we saw before. So there is this meditation upon the futility of things that Rembrandt is interested in. So Ter Bruchen is an important person, but as I mentioned last month, his teacher is equally important when it comes to the notion of drama. And now I'm gonna show you another painting called The Raising of Lazarus from 1631. And it's also an early work and it looks very Rembrandt, right? Well, I mean, we haven't seen enough of Rembrandt and he's changing rapidly, except this is by a fellow artist whose name is Jan Lievens, L-I-E-V-E-N-S. Jan Lievens, for some reason, my little slide here was cropped and I, it doesn't show the name, but Jan Lievens is another Leiden painter that Rembrandt is very close to at this time and they share studios or they, they're working side by side and they're always in competition with one another. Jan Lievens will become very, very well known. Right now we do not know him that much because he's no longer fashionable, his style, and he also changed a lot. But in this particular painting, you can see the Rembrandtian, I'm saying, the Rembrandtian darkness, that notion of light and shadow, dramatic place. So Rembrandt is not the only one who does this in Leiden. And now I'm gonna show you just for the sake of comparison, and here I have the full label, Jan Lievens and Rembrandt, Raising of Lazarus. The slide uh, with Rembrandt's picture is a little too yellow, but still, it allows you to see how he conceives of this moment versus Levens. And honestly, I like Levens better. I always have liked Levens better. In a way, Levens creates a much nicer composition with that beautiful white diagonal, with the way in which the figures are concentrated in the left side, and the way in which Jesus stands over there, over the tomb of Lazarus. And he just shows you the hands of Lazarus projecting from the tomb, Levens. Whereas Rembrandt overemphasizes the drama. Rembrandt is not as refined. However, for the contemporaries, Rembrandt was the one who expressed emotion better than Levens, apparently. And there was one particular man who looked at Rembrandt and Levens and who was rather distinguished and had very good connections in Amsterdam, Constantin Hauhens, and he writes that Levens is a great portraitist, but Rembrandt, this young man, is extremely good at expressing emotions. And he pushes both of them, and they become associated with those genres. And Levens gets a lot of portrait commissions very quickly, and Rembrandt likes to become the history painter. So this particular work may have been done in a kind of friendly competition. Let's do who will do Raising of Lazarus better. But shortly thereafter, or during the same time period, 1629, 1630, Rembrandt paints a number of these history pictures that seem to be informed by his relationship to Peter Lastman, the teacher that I showed you earlier. And in these history pictures, such as Judas returning the 30 pieces of silver, you can see what he emphasizes again, idea of emotion, transformation, drama, almost as if you were looking at a theatrical performance on stage. And this is something else I want to mention. Theater is very alive in Holland at this time, morality plays, but also tragedies inspired by ancient tragedies. They called them Senecan drama with a lot of extreme emotions on stage, murders, deaths, etc., etc. So here is an example of a very, very theatrical painting painted by Rembrandt, not very big, but this was considered one of his more successful pictures when he started out, Judas returning the 30 pieces of silver. 
once more, you can see that the faces are not necessarily the most handsome faces in the world, but he likes to express humanity. He likes to give you a, an idea of all these differences. And you also see, by the way, a lot of oriental qualities in Rembrandt. And you might wonder, Judas returning the 30 pieces of silver, this is one of the people who is kind of in consternation looking back, right? But you can see that people with turbans, with this kind of golden cloaks, like many other artists of the time, they envisioned biblical antiquity as something connected with the Orient. So oftentimes, stories that take place in the Bible, they will feature human beings wearing turbans and other kinds of attire associated with 16th and 17th century Ottoman Empire or the East. And this was very, very typical for the time period, but Rembrandt in particular loves Orientalism, so to speak, introduction of these motifs in painting. I'm showing you the detail also to highlight his abilities as an artist. As a young man, he's already trying and accomplishing quite a bit in terms of texture, light, sheen, reflection. Look what pigment can do, how well he can emulate sort of the glittering qualities, right, of, of the embroidery here, or that cloak that this man is wearing, or the turban. But Rembrandt is, on the one hand, about drama, and that lovely shield that's hanging there, you can see again that intimation, I mean, or a suggestion of gold or something reflective. He, he likes to do those effects very much early on. But at the same time, Rembrandt also loves that Leiden tonality in his early years. And he loves this idea of melancholia and introversion and introspection. So, this is an example of what we call a highly theatrical, extroverted painting. This is a picture that's total opposite from the same time period, which one art historian in America who wrote an influential article about this many years ago talked about the distinction between pictures that are about absorption, something interior, such as this, and pictures that are about theatricality. And in Rembrandt, you find both. In Vermeer, it's more about absorption. But in Rembrandt, you have both pictures that are all about stage, theater, high drama, and pictures that are about thought process. And this is a wonderful example of those paintings in which he explores that human interiority. And you might wonder immediately, how do we know this is St. Paul? Nobody wrote that this is St. Paul anywhere. He didn't tell us it was St. Paul. Art historians think that it is St. Paul at his writing desk because St. Paul, among the apostles, is usually depicted as a man who is older with a bald head and long beard. He is always writing or reading. He's the most learned one. And there is a sword hanging on the wall. That sword is the symbol of his martyrdom. He was decapitated. If you see a painting of an older man at his desk with lots of books and a sword nearby, you can assume it is St. Paul. And you might say, hold on one second, we are in Protestant Holland. Why are they painting saints? They can provided, they can even paint Jesus, provided that they emphasize their historical function rather than creating an icons that you pray to. So religious painting is of course allowed, but it changes. They no longer create altarpieces and icons, meaning paintings that you pray to, but they just paint scenes from the Bible including scenes from the life of Christ and lives of the apostles that are didactic. They teach you about the Bible as a history. 
So that's the difference between the Protestant visual culture and the Catholic visual culture in 17th century. The Dutch did not eliminate all of religious paintings, quite the contrary, but they're very different in tenor and intention. But as you can tell, Rembrandt is interested in humanity, physiognomy, and he's very interested in aging. He's very interested in what happens to us throughout life. What kinds of marks are left as a result of human experience? And he seems to have a couple of models that he uses very often for a number of different paintings. This old man, for example, also appears in a print, an etching from the same time period. We just call it old man looking down. And when you look at this etching, you also realize that it's highly experimental that instead of those very disciplined etchings where all of the lines are uniform, Rembrandt is playing with the medium and you have this incredible mess of lines, but at the same time, despite this freedom and the mess of lines, you have very good contrasts of light and shadow and you have a very lifelike appearance as a result. So the old faces fascinate him. Here are a couple of others that I want to show you. This is just an old man with a fur cap, again, with something rather exotic as a headgear, and the old woman whom they call the artist's mother. I don't know why they call her the artist's mother. She appears in a couple of paintings, but you can see that she's also wearing an oriental cover, head cover. What, what happens? Rembrandt acquires a couple of pieces of clothing from all this trade in Holland, in his studio and uses them as props. When he wants to paint somebody that looks like from Old Testament, he'll give them some cloak with embroidery and they turn into some kind of prophetess from the Old Testament. And some people have said that she is one of those prophetesses, but that actually this is his mother. And maybe Rembrandt was using at this time since he didn't have a lot of money to pay for models, the people he knew an uncle, father, mother. So they feature again and again in his early works. But it's pretty good painting, right? It's pretty good painting. But I'm gonna show you another one with that same old lady or very similar old lady in profile known as old woman reading a Bible by somebody else who looks very much like Rembrandt, correct? In fact, if you didn't know, if I didn't put this label, you would think this is Rembrandt. And you would be correct to assume that. So, in his early years, in Leiden, Rembrandt works side by side with that first artist I mentioned, Jan Levens, and another one whose name is Herit Dow. Both Levens and Herit Dow will eventually be much more successful than Rembrandt. Dow will become this man. You can see this is a rather nice and large scale painting in comparison to many others by Dow. He will become a specialist in small paintings similar to those of Vermeer, and he becomes known as a true master of what we call the fine manner versus the rough manner. And Herit Dow will get so much money for his paintings, both in Holland and elsewhere, that at one point he would be selling his little panels for their weight in gold. Seriously. Well, they were thin panels, but still. <laughs> for their weight in gold. So Dow and Levens, Levens becomes very sought after as a portrait painter. So Rembrandt worked with very talented young men, shared studios with them. My point is that even from the get-go in Leiden, he had very good friends to work with and competitors, so to speak. And you see in this painting, Herit Dow is depicting again an exotic looking woman who is reading the Bible, and you know, this is fascinating. You might say, okay, a woman reading a Bible. Nobody in Europe was painting a woman reading a Bible at this time, but in the Dutch Protestant Republic. The word, the word, the word 
in Protestant culture. Everything begins from the Bible. You do not need the priest to mediate. And the idea is that also women have very high level of literacy in Holland. One of the great things that happens in Holland as a result of, well, both Calvinism, Protestantism, but the trade and the fact that men were traveling throughout the world and creating all of these relationships, East Indies, West Indies, coming here, etc. One of the great things that happens in Holland is that women were left at home, and since for months and months they had to take care of household and business, they had the highest level of literacy of any place in Europe among women. So it's interesting that a picture like this appears in Holland, a woman reading a Bible. But she also looks like a character from the Old Testament herself. And look, the same woman in an etching and the same woman, my God, in another etching. And you might wonder, who would want this for home? And the same woman in another etching. Why does he emphasize these features so much of people? Because he believes that actually the aged face is like a map of human experience, like the map makers. And that whole idea of experience, memory, repository is something very important to Rembrandt. And he makes these etchings from the get-go. 1629, 1630, he makes a whole series of small etchings. This is 1628, that look extremely modern. And what I mean by modern is that he seems to be scratching. He seems to be leaving areas completely unfinished. It looks almost like some kind of late 19th century etching by Whistler. Rembrandt, instead of making beautiful pictures, makes little expressive sketch-like etchings. So a young man who is trying very hard to show you that he can be very different and he can create works, you know, in, in a certain way, the radical approach to etching with all these unfinished areas and scratched areas in the plate is something akin to what Picasso would be, would be doing at the beginning of 20th century. We cannot perceive the, the sort of the, the separation of Rembrandt from the visual culture of the time period, but when you see that, when you see those lines on the back of that woman, when you see how careless it appears, that's where that modernity or the germ of that modernity is in Rembrandt. And people somehow liked them and bought them. He sold a lot of these etchings. So there was a visual culture that appreciated experimentation. And of course, visual culture that was very interested in human expression, which is why he would create a whole series of these faces of the same person. And this is another point I must make, that at the beginning, of the 17th century. We talked about empiricism, we talked about interest in the senses, we talked about vanitas. There is one other thing that we need to understand about early Rembrandt, that at this moment, the goal of painting is not just to capture the way we appear, but the goal of painting is to capture what we feel, the movements of the soul, what is internal in us, rather than how we appear which is why you will find so many pictures by Rembrandt at this time where he will use the same face with different emotions to show you that under different kinds of illumination, uh, on different days, under different conditions, human beings are very different. There is no fixed likeness. Our likeness depends on how we feel, what we carry within including, obviously, age and all the traces that it leaves on us. So this is something that's fascinating and quite novel and modern. And this leads me to a couple of images that I want to show you for this early Rembrandt that have to do with himself. Look at that. This is one of the earliest self-portraits by Rembrandt from the 20s, 1628, 29. And what do you notice in this self-portrait? That he is barely visible. There is something 
as I said, eccentric. This person, from the beginning, tries to challenge our assumptions about what is a good portrait. You might say he 